we worship this morning, I invite you all to the foot of the cross where we witness Jesus' love poured out for us. Your 
just not that hard to find. So I will praise you, Jesus. So I will, I will praise you on the mountain. And I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Wherever I am, 
on and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses that he is God. Father in heaven, we thank you for many blessings in the past week and for being our Redeemer, our healer, our guide, and sustainer of life. We come before you with heavy hearts in desperate need of your mercy and healing. Lord, you know these challenges our world is facing today. We want to lift up our families, our friends, our neighbors. There's battling in COVID, our leaders, healthcare, and other workers, the returning students and staff, and also those who need to hear of your salvation. We pray for faith instead of fear and love instead of hate. May we look to you for hope and strength. We trust that anything happens is for a reason that your glory will be manifested in everything we do, see, experience, and believe. Lord our God, as we listen to your messages and promises today through your servant, we invite your Holy Spirit that we may experience peace of mind and invigorate our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, who made us one with you. Allow your servant to share us your transforming words today and let us now worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone who is watching out there. May God bless you wherever you are today. I was going to do or start on a 10-part series on the book of Acts today. But about a week ago, God reminded me that as a pastor, I am called to talk about the things that my people are thinking about and talking about. And I've learned that uh, this subject in particular is on the minds of young people especially. So please pray for me as I talk about this tough subject today. And pray for those who are going to listen. Would you? Would you do that today? I ask for your prayers because I want to be biblical today. I, I only want to be biblical today. Um, I don't want this to be at all a, uh, a political idea. You know, I think that's um, a lot of where our problems are in the world right now in our country is that we can't talk about an issue without jumping on the back of the of the elephant or the donkey. Um, it seems like we can't talk about an, I an issue or issues without being labeled or labeling people as progressive or conservative. So today I want to look at an issue uh, from the Bible and the Bible only. So I hope that you guys can be biblical with me today. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as I open up your word as we open up your word, as we listen for your voice. Lord, would you speak to your people here today? Sometimes the things that you've put on our hearts are uncomfortable, but Lord, they're needed and we must deal with them through the lens of scripture. 
So Lord, open up our hearts today. Open up our minds. Lord, if there's any closed hearts, including mine, please, Lord, do your work within us. Help us to know what you would have to say to us because your word is truth. So please, Lord, hear this prayer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, my friends, there, is been, there has been a lot of talk about social justice these days. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about race and, and what's wrong in the world, what's wrong specifically in our country. And uh, the political climate is crazy. As a pastor, but more so as a Christian, I will always look at what the Bible teaches about a subject. And I hope that as a Christian, if you're listening to me right now, I hope you will always go by what the Bible teaches on a particular subject. Not what society is teaching you and not what mainstream culture is teaching, not what social media is teaching, but what the scriptures teach and that you would search deep into scripture from, from a heart of... Uh, 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 wanting to learn knowledge, lest you and I be deceived. So we're lifting up the Bible here today, like I said earlier already. I've uh, run into some passionate people when it comes to this subject. And, and, and I want to tell you right now, this is not to say, that's not to say that I'm mocking anybody right now. In fact, I want you to know that your passion is a beautiful thing. Your passion is a good thing. Because as we will see in this message today, justice is important to God. In fact, God is passionate about this subject too. Uh, that what's right, what's wrong, how to live justly, is consistent, or there are consistent themes throughout the Bible. So if it's important to God, it should be important to us. Amen? Today we look at what justice really is from the one who created justice. After all, justice and mercy are the foundations of his throne, right? Psalms 97. And there are many passages in scripture that talk about justice, many of them. In fact, on Wednesday night, our prayer line, we've been going through the book of Psalms. One um, chapter of the Psalms every week, and it just seems like all of them touch on justice. But if you were to look at people who've studied out this subject, you would hear this one particular passage especially. It's probably the go-to passage when it talks about, when the Bible talks about justice. And I want you to know it, I want you to know it well, because I want you to look at it, not just in this hour. I want you to look at it, and I want you to study it for yourself. It's Isaiah chapter 58. Would you please go with me to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Again, this is the primary theme. This is the primary passage when it comes to justice. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read some verses. So please follow along with me. Isaiah chapter 58. You guys ready? Amen. Here we go. Isaiah 58. The Word of God says, verse 1, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Verse 3, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Go to verse 6. God answers their question. Why fast? Look, look at verse 6 of Isaiah 58. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, says the Lord, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Verse 8, Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. We're going to stop right there 
in Isaiah chapter 58. I want you to know that there's a parallel scripture. You can write this down if you're a note taker. It's found in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8 and 9. And it says, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So here it is. What is justice from Isaiah chapter 58 and from parallel verses? What is justice? We're going to summarize what we just read in Isaiah 58. And basically you can break it down in three portions of what we just read, Isaiah chapter 58. In verse 1, justice means that you speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. The second part, verse 6, you fight for those who are being treated uh, um, uh, unfairly. You fight for the rights of those who are being treated unfairly. And in verse 7, when you see a need, like you see your, you see someone who is hungry, or you see someone who's living in poverty, when you see a need, you do your best to meet that need. Let me say that again, because this is, this is so important. What is justice? First, you speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Number two, you fight for the rights of those who are being treated unfairly. And then number three, when you see someone in need, you do what you can to meet that need. Biblical justice. Biblical justice, right there. Spells it out. But let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Tim Keller, awesome biblical scholar. In my opinion, he gives the best uh, study on this subject. And he, and, he, and he shows that justice in Scripture is most often, in Hebrew, the word mishpat. Mishpat. And mishpat is used 200 times, 200, over 200 times in Scripture. And it simply means, mishpat simply means that you treat people equitably. You treat people the same. And it specifically is used for those, uh, 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 for context of poor and rich. In other words... Treat people the same, whether they have money or whether they don't have money. You treat people the same, with the same value. That's mishpat, okay? But this passage, Isaiah 58 verse 2, doesn't use the word mishpat. Mishpat is the most used word for justice. But this word for justice in verse 2 of Isaiah 58 is not mishpat. It's the word sedaka. Sedaka. And sedaka is justice in terms of right relationships. Listen to this. Sedaka means that everyone is treated with the with same relationship as everyone else. Everyone would be in right relationship with everyone else. And this happens when you're in right relationship with God. That's the context of sedaka. It has to do with right relationships, right relationships with others, equal relationships with others, and then it starts from a right relationship with God. So biblical justice, get this, biblical justice, this idea of justice cannot be taken out of its proper context, that of being in right relationship with God. Which brings us to our next question. Where does justice come from? We, we've seen what justice is, very simply, right? Very simply, we know that justice is speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves, who do not have a voice. We know that justice now is fighting for the rights of those who are being treated unfairly. And we know that justice is that when you see a need, you do your best to meet that need. But where does justice come from? This is equally as an important question. Where does it come from? Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. Man, I hope you guys are still with me. Verse 2. Look, it says, They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways at the end of verse 2. They take delight in approaching God. Where does justice come from? It comes from seeking after God. My friends, it comes from seeking after God. Knowing His heart. Sharing His heart. Loving what He loves and hating what He hates. Like injustice. Please hear this. And young people, if I've lost you, come back. Come back because I really want you to hear this especially. Justice is birthed, it is birthed out of a love for God. Justice doesn't come from guilt. Justice will not happen because someone or some people or some organization are telling you what to do or guilting you into what to do or shaming you into what to do. 
It only comes after seeking after God. We can only love people the way God loves people when we, when we ask Him to give us the eyes to see people the way He sees people. You understand? And I know some will say to me, maybe you even have this in your mind right now, but Glenn, things won't change. Racism won't change unless laws change. And I would agree to an extent. Some laws need to change. We can legislate to make change, but understand, true change can only come from the heart of God. True change can only come when we know God's heart. We can change racist laws, and obviously in history, that had to happen. We can change racist laws, but we can never take the racism out of a heart without the love of Christ. It is the gospel that creates real change. It's like, it's like getting married, BJ. You can be legally married, uh-huh. But in order to really love your spouse, listen to me now, man. In order to really love your spouse, it comes from deep within. A, a, a legal document doesn't make that change. Only a heart of God, only a heart after God can make that change. So I want, to, I want you guys to see something. It's a beautiful promise in Isaiah chapter 58. Man, I really want you, to guys, you guys to see this. Please, please. Again, if I've lost you, come back. I want you to see this if-then promise in Isaiah chapter 58. It's an if-then promise. Remember the uh, promise we, we prayed a lot, actually, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's an if-then promise. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Listen to this. If my people. Then, right? Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Did you hear that? If, then promise. I want you to see that in Isaiah 58, it is stacked with if, then promises. Oh man, I want you guys to see this. This is a powerful thing in God's word. So watch this. In, in the end of verse 9, we, we finished in the beginning of verse 9 in our reading, but look at the end of verse 9 in Isaiah 58. It says, If you take away the yoke from your midst, if, right? Verse 10, If you extend your soul to the hungry, verse 10, Then your light shall dawn in the darkness. Watch this. This is especially for us Sabbath keepers. Verse 13 and 14, there's an if-then promise. Excuse me. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, watch this, verse 14. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. If-then promise. It's for the Sabbath, and it's for justice. So watch this, going back to verse, uh, verse 8. If you do these things, look, verse 6 and 7, right? If you do this, if you practice biblical justice, verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Then your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness, righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Did you guys hear that? What a beautiful if-then promise that if we, if we obey what God is calling us to do in regards to justice, then our light will shine. Then God's glory will be seen in the world. Then when we call, God will answer. It's a beautiful promise. And so that's why when I see passionate young people, I'm like, man, give me some of that. I want to be a part of that. Let's join them but let's join them with biblical justice. You know, speaking of young people that are passionate, I, uh, I asked some young people to, to help me with this message, to help me with a definition. By the way, I've asked young people who are both near and far, so you can try to guess who they are, but, but uh, they, they're in, in such a variety of places that I, and I'm not saying their names, so, so you probably won't guess who they are. Anyway. I want you to hear from them. I want you to hear what they had to say for that, to that question, what is social justice to you in your, in your minds? 
Young person number one. To me, social justice means being treated fairly, not treated on the basis of skin color, country of origin, language, money, or power. We get treated by the same standard. I love that. Beautiful. Young person number two, I believe social justice is when you recognize the injustices that somebody or a group of people face, even if you don't see them yourself. I love that. Then make a change or fight for change so that they can have equality in all aspects of society. Amen. Young person number three, I'd have to say being treated with equal opportunity. Beautiful. Simple, beautiful. Young person number four, my definition of social justice would be the idea of equality for everyone in terms of wealth, health, opportunity, etc. within a society. But this equality for everyone is regardless of a person's legal situation, how much money they make, and other factors. Beautiful. I left the, the longest one for last and I had to summarize it because this young person gave me a really, really long explanation. So I had to summarize it, but it's, 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 it's so beautiful. And this is what this person says. What everyone deserves is equality of opportunity. Equal outcome shouldn't be the expectation. Personal choice has a lot to do with outcome. And then, he, and then they throw in some scriptures. An example in the Bible comes from Matthew 25. I love it. There were three servants given talents. The first two went to work and multiplied the talents, while the third buried his. They had equal opportunity, but the result, the outcome, was personal choice. Wow. You know, I, I, I wanted you to hear what these young people have said about social justice, because I want you to see that they're thinking about this, and they believe in this, and they're passionate about this. I want you to hear what they have to say. You know, I've always believed, and we've always taught as a church, right, that it is our young people that are going to help make change and bring in the coming of Jesus Christ. And man, let me tell you, that's why I want to give them, especially, and all of us, really, a biblical framework of what justice really is, because I believe that if they have Bible on their side, if, they're backed up, if they've backed up their convictions and their passions with Scripture, then they really have power behind their movement. They really have power behind their convictions. So, what is justice? What is biblical justice from Isaiah chapter 58? Again, just for the sake of clarity, for the sake of repetition, for the sake of learning, what is justice from Isaiah 58? Again, it's speaking out for those who do not have a voice. Two, it is fighting for the rights of those who are being treated misfairly, uh, 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 mis mistreated unfairly. Sorry. And then number three is that when you see a need, practical, practical godliness, right? You see a need, like someone who's living in poverty, someone who doesn't have a food, uh, someone has, who doesn't have food. You do your best to meet that need. That's biblical justice. Now what? Is it not? Again, if I've lost you, come back. I need you to hear this. I really, really need you to hear this. What is justice not? Again, I'm going through, I'm going through what Scripture says. What is justice not? Justice is not revenge. Please listen to this. I'm going to repeat. I'm going to repeat it. Justice is not revenge. Unfortunately, much of the sentiments out there are not justice from Scripture, rather revenge. But the Bible is clear. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? Justice is not revenge. Revenge does not come out of, heart, out of a heart of love. Revenge comes out of a love, out of a heart of hate. And we got to be careful. That's not biblical. We got to be very careful that justice does not mean revenge. And I hear that on a lot of people. And I don't want to point fingers or anything like that. I don't want to appear like, like I'm so judgmental. But that's what I hear. And that is not clear. That is not what justice is in Scripture. It is not revenge. Second, justice is not guilt-based. Now, I've already touched upon this. It's not guilt-based. It is God-inspired. It is God-inspired. It is birthed out of the heart of God. We, we can't do things like verse 6 and 7 out of guilt, my friends. We can't do what is right out of guilt. Guilt has its place at times. Guilt can perhaps get us started on doing what's right, but it does not have any lasting change. Guilt does not, does not make lasting change. Okay, Only a heart from God does. So, so justice is not guilt. 
based. It is God-inspired. Justice is not anti-government. Please listen to me. Justice is not anti-government. Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, right? Listen, I've said this many times. Jesus was a radical. He was. Jesus was a radical. He was not a rebel. He worked within the system to bring change. He didn't want to, he didn't set up to break a system. In fact, those who were listening and following Jesus, who thought that he was going to break the system of Rome, they thought that that's what his job was. They did not understand the mission of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to break up a system. He tried to work it to bring change within that system. He was a radical, not a rebel. He was not anti-government. And we got to be careful. Justice is not anti-government. Justice is also not socialism. Again, just trying to be biblical. And, and, and let me say this very plainly. There are some passionate people out there who are calling for social justice, but who are really operating undercover for socialism, not social justice, not biblical justice. And they are pushing for an equal distribution of wealth, and that is not what the Bible teaches whatsoever. In fact, when you look at that idea, it already breaks two of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet. We got to be very, very careful of that idea, although it seems to gain a lot of traction, be very popular these days. Justice is not socialism. Now, some who are bent towards socialism use the Bible to try to, uh, to try to back up their belief and back up their ideology. But I want you to know that they use the book of Acts way out of context. They use the book of Acts as biblical proof for their cause because the early church, they gave up everything and they helped each other. But let's remember, the early church in the book of Acts gave of their resources voluntarily out of a heart for God because the church had to support each other because they were going through persecution. For the sake of clarity, let's go over that real quick. Biblical justice is not revenge. Biblical justice is not guilt-based. Biblical justice is not anti-government and biblical justice is not socialism. It is speaking up for those who don't have a voice. It is fighting for the rights of those who are being treated unfairly, and it is giving to those who are in need. So, I join you. I willingly, hand in hand, join you with our young social justice warriors. I join you because I believe that if we're called to do, if we're called to do biblical justice, let's do it together, together with the energy and the passion of young people and with the understanding of the gospel and its mission, that the mission is that the gospel is to be uh, uh, brought to the entire world. If we should do that together, I believe, if then, I believe that the glory of the Lord will be seen in the world. I believe light will come into darkness and I believe that Christ's coming will definitely be soon. I believe God is calling us. This is a challenge to the church. Biblical justice from Isaiah 58 is a challenge to the church. It means no more church as usual. It means that we don't just come so that we can be fed. No, we be fed. We are fed so that we can feed others. We have too much comfort in the American church here today. This is our time. This is our time. Our young people are calling for it. This is our time. You know, at one time, you guys know this. Christians were on the front. They were on the front lines of justice at one time. At one time, Christians fought all over the world to abolish slavery. Look what the church did at one time. You know, you look back at our own denomination's history, and I look back at it proudly, I really do, that, that, that pioneer Adventists were abolitionists and they helped even in the Underground Railroad, even at the stations for the Underground Railroad, you can see that in our history, beautiful part of our history. Today, the Adventist Church is very strong in certain things. It's strong in fighting for religious liberty. Man, we believe in that wholeheartedly. 
It's, it's very strong, very active in, in, in feeding programs, hospitals, disaster relief. Those are things that we've done well, church, and we praise God for that. But if we are to be honest, we also can look at areas of justice that we're not doing so well at, such as pro-life causes, such as uh, 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 where we're not strong is when we, we're, we're, when we help or we don't help really in orphanages, at least not to a great extent. We, we, we're, not, we're not there on the front lines with sex trafficking. We're not so strong with this ho whole push for race, racial reconciliation. We have a lot to learn and we have a lot to, uh, to do yet and to get stronger at. And we have to admit that. I believe biblical justice in 2020 is a call to action. My friends, we don't have much time. We don't have much time. And in your heart of hearts, I know you believe that too. And so instead of being a church that just goes through the motions or just plays church, man, I believe God has given us an opportunity to really get involved, to really get involved in the things that, that really make a difference in this world. I believe God's calling us once again to the front lines of mission and the front lines of justice, that the gospel would go out to the world, if then. I want to leave you guys with a few texts and a few quotes, and I am done. Proverbs 21, verse 3. God would rather have our just actions than our sacrifices. And by the way, sacrifices in the con is the context of external worship. Yes, God loves that we worship, but He would rather have. Proverbs 21, verse 3. He would rather have our just actions. Isaiah, uh, I, I think... What this is really saying is that they go together, right? We can't have one without the other. Isaiah 61 verse 8 says that God loves justice and hates injustice. Listen to that. Isaiah 61 verse 8, God loves justice, justice and he hates injustice. So church, we can't take a seat about this, about this issue. We can't just like let it, like pretend it's going to go away. God hates injustice. He loves justice. We can't be lukewarm about it. God's not lukewarm about it. We can't just sit on the sidelines. Let's get involved. Let's do something to lift up the heavy burdens of those around us. That's our call. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 9. I'm giving you these texts. I hope that you can write them down if you're a note taker. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 9. Justice is seen. Listen to this. Justice is seen when mercy and compassion are given. In other words, when words and deeds go together. That's when justice is seen. I love this quote from Micah Frias, and he says this, The kingdom of God is made visible through the local church. I'll say that again. The kingdom of God is made visible through the local church. So if the local church is doing what it's called to do, then God's kingdom is seen. If it's not doing what it's called to do, then God's kingdom is not seen. I love this quote from my favorite author. The Desire of Ages, page 641. Listen to this, it's so important. This is so huge. Love to man is the earthward manifestation of the love of God. It was to impart this love, to make us children of one family, that the King of glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, from John 15. When we love the world as he loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Man, did you guys hear that quote? She says, an if-then promise, just like we've seen. If-then. She says, when we love the world as he loved it, then our mission is accomplished. Then we are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Man, isn't that the goal? To have heaven in our hearts. May this beautiful song that we're about to sing be our prayer. Lord, increase our love. Help us to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lines and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in our eyes, they would see you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, you said yourself that you would leave the 99 for the one. 
It is my prayer that we would love like you, seeking justice and mercy. Help me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one in whom you loved and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love and help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lies and seeks the truth. Oh, that one day look in my eyes, they would see you, even in just a smile. They would feel the Father's love Oh how Oh how you love us From the homeless To the famous and in between You formed us You made us carefully Cause in the end We're all your children Help me to love with open arms like you do A love that erases all the lies and seeks the truth Oh, that one day look in my eyes, they would see you Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love Jesus, help me to love like you Help me to love with open arms like you do A love that erases all the lies and seeks the truth Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you Even in just a smile, they would feel the Father's love My friends, before we do our closing prayer, I'm going to invite you to take someone's hand next to you. Make sure you're connected. Take someone's shoulder, if that's more uh, comfortable for you. 
And uh, let's pray together, huh? As a church family, as a united church family. Um, and by the way, before we pray, I do have to make just a couple quick announcements. <laughs> Please mark your calendars. August 1 is going to be a very special day for us in our church. August 1, we're still going to have our morning service online. But August 1, I'm going to invite you to the HAA field, right next to Hindale Adventist Academy, the field right next to it. We are going to have a Vespers at 7 p.m., a Vespers slash baptismal service. It's going to be an outdoor service. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be great. We're going to practice social distancing. The only thing that is required of you is to bring your lawn chair and bring your face mask. That is the only price of admission. So August 1, please join us. It's going to be fantastic. And then, just so you know, next week we're going to start a series, a new series. So important. It's on the book of Acts. And this is not just going to be a regular series that we come and watch. We are going to challenge our leaders and we're going to challenge our people to after each message, we're going to go that week and we're going to dig more with our small groups. We're going to look into it more. We're going to get deeper. We're going to get connected about the mission and about the message of the book of Acts. It's going to be great. We're going to have the message and we're going to have small groups and we're going to do this for 10 weeks. We are looking forward to what that's going to do to help bring motivation and bring a sense of mission back to our church, even at a time of pandemic. So we look forward to what God has in store for us. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for being with us in a special way. Lord, we've heard a challenging message, a, a message that calls for action. Lord, I pray that we would not be content to just sit and to just be comfortable I pray that you would get us and wake us up and, and, and shake us to our core because it has to come from inside. It cannot come from guilt. It has to come, like we've said, from a God-inspired uh, heart. So Lord, do whatever it takes to move us and to shake us and to save us into your kingdom and to see that others are saved as well. This is our prayer because this is our mission and we want to say yes, sir, to what you're calling us to do. We thank you. We praise you. We want to honor you for the rest of this Sabbath day. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful rest of the Sabbath day.